Thank you very much for the introduction and invitation to the analysis seminar. So as you see in the title, I'm going to talk about some illiteracy results on uh, 2D Euler type equation. So let's start with the 2D incompressible Euler equation. So the equation looks like this, and uh, it describes the motion of incompressible inviscid fluid. So in the equation, there are two unknown functions, u and p, where u represents the flow velocity and p is pressure. Uh, the first equation uh, derived from Newton's second law, F equals to ma, where the force is generated by pressure only. Uh, in reality, the fluid also has uh, internal friction, but so the force is also generated by the friction. But in all the equation case, we assume the ideal situation that there's no internal friction. And the second equation explains the incompressibility, which gives the uh, volume-preserving property of the uh, fluid along the trajectory. And here we restrict our attention uh, to spatial domain, R2. Uh, but, of, but working with the two unknown function is uh, oftentimes inconvenient, so we also consider the equivalent formulation for the vorticity. So to drop one of the unknown function, we take the two-dimensional curve, uh, which is defined as a uh, gradient per dot product, where the gradient per is partial two comma partial one. So if you take this operator uh, to the 2D all equation, then the pressure will be dropped, and the remaining part will be written in terms of um, as the equation for the vorticity, which is the two-dimensional curve of the velocity. Yes, so as you see, the equation is a uh, transport equation, and the drift velocity uh, can be written in terms of vorticity as follows. Okay. Yeah. And using the explicit kernel of inverse Laplacian, uh, we can relate the velocity with vorticity through the explicit uh, integral form. And we call this as the uh, B of Zabat law. And since we can always recover the velocity from vorticity, we, we say these two equations are equivalent. Okay, I don't need to go here anymore. Okay, so now we have equation, then the first fundamental question would be the well coordinates. So for 2D Euler equation, we have the well-known results for uh, the global well coordinates in the Sobolov space HS for S greater than 2. And of course, for n-dimensional case, we also have local well coordinates results in the general Sobolov space WSP for S greater than n over p plus one. Uh, these well coordinates results has long history, but in short, local well coordinates can be obtained by a energy method, and the global lifespan in the case of R two uh, can be obtained through the builder cosmometer criteria. Then where is the restriction S greater than 2 uh, comes from? Uh, to see this, let's visit uh, energy method. So if you take this uh, differential operator, Js of S order, to the equation and then test against Js u, then the nonlinear term will have the following commutator structure. And controlling this part is the main part uh, of the energy method. So first, we apply the commutator estimate, uh, which is proved by the cutoff points. And then we get the following uh, upper bound. But as you see, uh, this uh, estimate didn't uh, still holds when s equal to 2, and even when s is low than 2. So this doesn't give any restriction on s. And once we have this, we need, the, uh, we need to control the lifted slope of the velocity, which can be done uh, by Sobolov embedding when s is greater than 2. But as we all know, when s equal to 2, Sobolov embedding fails. So to summarize, the restriction really comes from the Sobolov embedding, which is required to control the lifted slope of the velocity. So as a result, we get the borderline case for the well-postness as h2 on velocity side, 
and H1 intersected with H dot minus 1 for vorticity. So if you roughly consider vorticity as uh, one derivative or velocity, this would, you can see that this would be the corresponding, this would be the corresponding uh, space to the H2. And on this space, uh, because of lack of Sobolov embedding, the well postness of 2D Euler equation was long-standing open problem. And there are several efforts uh, to understand 2D Euler dynamics in the borderline <laughs> space. On one hand, people try to find the right space. So here, right space means the space where we have the well postness. So people consider the solution space which has the same scaling with H2, but slightly regular than that. So for example, the following uh, uh, Bezop space, uh, we, can, uh, we can consider the following Bezop spaces. So on these spaces, Bisig and Chen, Peck and Park can obtain the local well postness. And the main idea is the Lipsis norm of the velocity can be controlled uh, when solution is in these spaces. But here I want to point out that this only holds when the Bezop parameter is uh, given as one. And when it's greater than one, uh, we, can't, uh, we can't get this type of inequality. So this uh, approach didn't give any clue on the well postness to the Euler in space H2. On the other hand, uh, Chang, Constantine, and Wu fixed the borderline space. Uh, but instead, they regularize the equation. So more precisely, they put the regularizing operator uh, to the uh, to the Euler velocity in the vorticity formulation. And one of the sample case of this regularizing operator is given as follows. So this operator indeed regularized the to the Euler velocity at the level of logarithm of Laplacian. And here, gamma is the regularization parameter, uh, parameter, which tells you how strong the regularization is. So for example, when gamma equal to <coughs> zero, it corresponds to the identity operator. So the corresponding equation is the unregularized model, which is 2D all over vorticity equation. And when gamma gets larger, it gives more regular velocity. So as a result of this regularization, uh, Chen Wu can obtain the local well postness in the borderline Sobolov space when the regularization is strong enough, which is when gamma is greater than one over two. And additionally, they also obtain the global well postness in the subcritical space. Then where is this number, threshold number one over two comes from? To so see, uh, Well, so I'm gonna talk later. Uh, yeah, so you can actually get global well postness only when gamma is greater than or equal to three over two. Oh, I'm gonna so mention. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna mention that. Yes. Yeah. So for now, let's talk about uh, how to get uh, uh, where this threshold number comes from. So in their argument, again, the main part is how to control the Lipschitz norm of the velocity. And for that, uh, we first move to the free SI and try to control it by the borderline space norm of the solution. Then the remaining factor is finite only when gamma is greater than one over two. So this is where we get uh, the threshold number. And for this good gamma, we can get the following differential inequality then uh, as uh, by using the energy method, we can again get local well -posed. Okay, so now let me summarize the null result on this uh, regularized model in the borderline of a loop space. So what I just mentioned is when gamma is greater than one over two, we have local well postness. And when gamma is greater than or equal to three over two, Dong and Li obtain the global well postness. But here, interestingly, there is a gap between these two numbers. And when gamma is in between, whether the uh, the solution has global lifespan or not, it's still open problem. And on the other hand, when gamma equals to zero, which is the 2D Euler vorticity equation case, 
uh, eventually Bugen and Lee establishes the ill Postmix region. But then remaining question is, so we know when gamma is greater than one over two, it's well Postmix, and when gamma equals to zero, it's ill Postmix. Then what happened when gamma is in the intermediate region? Will it be well post or ill post? So that's our main question in this talk. Uh, is the to the yeah to the older vertical equation? Sorry, what is your question? The original question is what happened after one over two and what about to the old, yes yes, but that's that's but that's solved. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, so before we talk about the answer to uh, this question, uh, let's talk about our equation a bit more. So re remember that our equation has the transport equation form, so it's very natural to interpret it in Lagrangian viewpoint. Well, in fact, uh, our proof will combine the Lagrangian and Eulerian viewpoints together. So for that, we're gonna introduce the flow map, which is defined as a, a, a uh, so as a solution to the following equation. Well, you can also just call it as a characteristic map. And here, this part corresponds to our zeroth velocity. And then phi xt describes the location of particle uh, starting from a point x in time t. And using this flow map, uh, our regularized model can be simply written as following form. And also we can observe that our uh, velocity has divergence free condition. So the Jacobian of the flow map will be preserved as one at any positive time. And from there we can get LP norm preservation of solution for any P between one and infinity, including the end point. Uh, and one last thing is, so uh, we can even control the velocity in L infinity norm space by L1 and L infinity norm of the uh, solution, uh, which is just by um, uh, the interpolation. And then um, by the LP norm preservation, we actually get uniform bound of the velocity, and which gave us the limitation of the maximal speed of the propagation of particles. So for example, if the initial data is compactly supported, then uh, the solution in a short, the support of solution in a short time will stay close to the support of initial data. So we call this phenomena as finite field propagation. Okay, so this, these are some backgrounds. And now let's talk about our main results. So my, the main theorem can be summarized by a, the following statement. So when gamma is in the intermediate region, we have the strong ill uh of this regularized model in the borderline double of space. Then what is a strong ill -posniss? So let's recall the usual ill uh, first. So by Hadamard, um, the evolution PDE is ill in some space X if one of the following condition is failed. The existence of solution in space X and the uniqueness and continuous dependence on initial data. And strong imposedness is a slightly stronger version than that, uh, which is uh, defined as follows. So for any compactly supported smooth initial data A, we can always find a perturbation beta, which can be made arbitrarily small in the borderline subval of space but the solution associated with the perturbed initial data leaves the borderline space instantaneously. <coughs> so in this definition, I want to point out several things. Uh, first, it satisfies the usual definition of uh, ill postness because both existence and continuous dependence on initial data are broken. So if you focus on the perturbed solution, even though the initial data stays on the borderline sobol of space, the solution doesn't exist in the space at any positive time. And also, even though we perturb initial data very little bit 
in the borderline subtle lobe space, um, the perturbed solution doesn't stay close to the original solution. But not only that, uh, the perturbed solution even make a quantum jump from the original solution in the following sense. So since the, ori the uh, original solution start from smooth initial data, it always has finite um, borderline space norm at any positive time, while the perturbed solution always have infinity borderline space norm. And lastly, uh, the discontinuity occurs at any initial data in a dense subset of the borderline subvelope space. So for this reason, uh, Rogan and Lee introduced the term strong ill closeness. And yeah, we're gonna uh, prove uh, that result. What is the next slide? Uh, the next one is? Yeah, but here, well, for uniqueness, at least you need uh, one solution existing here. I think the statement is totally different. I don't think, I don't know, I can't come up with a statement which break everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but thi this, yeah, but in this borderline space, the uniqueness, uh, I don't know any reason. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so we're gonna construct, so in the proof, we need to construct this type of perturbation. And the, uh, we're gonna construct two types of perturbation. One is non-compactly supported, and the other one is compact supported. So let me give the precise statement in the non-compact case. So the gamma is in the intermediate region and smooth initial data is given, then we can find non-compactly supported perturbation such that the perturbation <coughs> as it is small in the borderline subvelope of space, and not only that, it's small in L1 and L infinity uh, norm space. But then the perturbed solution has infinity borderline so, uh, sobolov norm at any positive time. But here, to identify this perturbed solution, we need its unique existence in some space. And such space is given in the second condition. And then one can ask, in what sense this infinity norm is achieved? Uh, in fact, we can find a sequence of set of the following form. So I guess it's better to draw a picture. So this is uh, axis of T and this is axis of X. And the QN, we can find QN of like, which looks like this. Q2 and Q3 and so on. So this is QN. And on each QN, the perturbed solution, L infinity in time, and homogeneous subvelope uh, norm, h dot one x is greater than n. Then if we choose some arbitrary time t0 on the following set, uh, we'll get infinity group. <coughs> okay, so this is statement for the non-compact case. Uh, right. Am I understanding correctly? Right, because at each time you should have a smooth part. Yes. It's only that you cannot control uniformly in time the norm. So this is what is what the scientist really wants to see. Yeah. So when so yeah. it is smooth, but when you because this one also involves with integrability. Right. So when when it's smooth, but like you can then yeah, but when you sum up, then exactly. blow up. And here I want to note that this. Uh, uh, sorry? Sorry? So the problem is that in space you determine time? Uh, in space I sum, yes. I So to compute the no, H1. But like this H1 dot norm mm -hmm. is finite or not? Whatever the time is. It's infinity all the time. Because if but you but choose. Speed, so, so without speed, well, because our, uh, so you mean, 
啊。Uh huh. Uh, almost everywhere in Philippines, <laughs> but yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So to make uh, now uh, this perturbation even compactly supported, we need additional assumption on given initial data. Well, this comes from some technicality of our scheme, but which is the oddness at least in one of the variables. And here, for convenience, I just choose x2. But with this assumption, we can always find compactly supported perturbation, which satisfy the similar condition as this. I think that's the problem. So, so this time, the problem would be when you convert to this kind of problem. Uh, what do you mean, the problem? Because pro initially, the, the last previous time, I would know that to go to here, or that to go to that. I don't know. I mean, you're saying Uh huh. But the H1 norm is. Uh huh. Uh, no, the theory doesn't say H1 norm. Uh huh. Yeah, I didn't say T. Okay, it's only for this. Uh huh. Okay. Yes. But so again, the, without the sequence in the last query, mm -hmm. it would be initially convenient. So o again, almost everywhere. So Not H1 yeah, yes, yes. H1. So then what will be the difficulty in establishing this strong L closeness when gamma is in the intermediate region? So first, our velocity is regular than, more regular than to the older, to the older velocity, but the borderline space remains the same. And usually the regularization uh, prevents the norm inflation. Well, so if you see the statement, we need certain norm inflation in the borderline of space but this reg uh, regularization usually prevents. So it is more difficult to have the ill closeness. And also one of the key ingredients of creating norm inflation is missing, which is the uh, explicit form of the kernel uh, relating the velocity with the solution. So in the case of 2D all equation, thanks to the BO sub allo, we have the explicit form. But with the additional regularizing operator, which is given as free uh, multiplier, we lose the explicit form. And this will give us a little bit of technical difficulty in our proof. But so do you know what, like how big your solution is? So I know. Like if you're going more than how big your uh, What is VBA? Uh, like this big of that means how big your initial Ah, so yeah, so I'm gonna get uh, essential lower bound and I also, well in the proof, I also use essential upper bound. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so now let me sketch the proof. So we're gonna follow the scheme for the strong ill closeness invented by Hugen and Lee. And the scheme consists of two parts, the local construction of the perturbation and gluing procedure. So in the local construction, we aim to find a family of initial data whose corresponding solution have a local borderline norm inflation. So which means that, so if we denote the sequence of solution uh, by omega n, then it satisfies uh, the following inequality. So is h dot what norm is greater than n, uh, and in a shorter time. So we're gonna construct a sequence of solution whose borderline space norm gets larger in shorter time. And if you compare these two conditions, you can really see that this sequence of local initial, uh, this sequence of solution will use as a local piece of the perturbed solution. So we call this solution as local solution and the cor corresponding initial data as local initial data. So then the next question is how to construct uh, this solution, sequence of solution. Well, so from the equation, we can write the gradient of solution in terms of gradient of initial data and Lagrangian deformation metric. And then if you take L2 norm to have large um, 
borderlines of a log norm <laughs> of the solution, we need at least large uh, Lagrangian deformation in an in L infinity norm space. So we're gonna first create large Lagrangian deformation, and from there we'll induce large uh, borderlines of a log norm. And once we construct the desired uh, family of initial data, in the next step, we're gonna glue them together with the given initial data so that the glue solution locally behaves like local solution. But in this process to overcome the difficulty arising from the regularization, we either need new technical ingredient or new approach. And I'll point out them in the course of the talk. So let's start with the creation of last Lagrangian deformation. So if I write the equation for the, so maybe I will even If I write the equation for the, the uh, Lagrangian deformation, the simple form would be like this. And from here, to get large Lagrangian deformation, we need large derivative of velocity. And one of the common way of having the large Lipschitz number of velocity is using initial data, which is old in both variables. This is because uh, this all symmetry makes the origin as a stagnation point and around that we're gonna have hyperbolic type flow so that we can expect uh, the last derivative velocity at the stagnation point. So this is the motivation of using odd asymmetry flows. So let me explain more detail. So if initial data is odd in both variables, the solution also odd in both variables. And that makes uh, the origin as a fixed point of the flow map and at that point the derivative of velocity has the following diagonal matrix form and thanks to this structure uh, there won't be any cancellation in the products of the matrix form and we get the Lagrangian deformation at the origin as the following form and here <coughs> lambda t corresponds to uh, this component and once we have this, we can expect that if we have initial data, which has last lambda value at initial time, then we have last Lagrangian deformation in shorter time. And indeed, we can make it work, but in the process, we need uh, the explicit kernel of the following operator. And so, but in the case of 2D Euler, we have the explicit form, but with the discrete multiplier T gamma, it's not easy to get simple explicit form. So instead, <coughs> as I mentioned, uh, I obtained the pointwise essential lower bound. So if you see the estimate, the first part corresponds to the uh, explicit kernel of the risk type operator, and the remaining part will explain you the effect of this regularizing operator. So once we have this, so we can get the last Lagrangian deformation by using the initial data, which is old in both variables, <coughs> and also which has last uh, derivative velocity at the origin. And so now let me give uh, one example of a family of initial data whose Lagrangian deformation gets larger in shorter time, but the initial data as it is gets smaller in the borderline space norm. The reason we need the smallness is uh, the subsequence of this family of initial data gonna be used as a per local piece of perturbation. So um, that's the reason we have the, we need the smallness. So the example is as follows. So we consider the G of A of the following form, where rho is uh, defined as follows. So it is an odd extension in both variables of the uh, bound function localized at the point 1.1. So the graph will be, looks like this. 
and then the graph of g of a will be uh, again odd extension and on the first quadrant it will consist of bunch of bubbles like bunch of bump functions uh, whose supports are disjoint to each other and then obviously this g of a is odd in both variables and then by adding more bubbles, we can make it have a uh, large derivative velocity at the initial time. But in this process, to fight with the regularization, compared with the 2D Euler equation case, we need to add more bubbles. So that makes our initial data have more, uh, much higher frequency than the one in Euler equation case. But this doesn't cause any trouble for now, but in fact, the genuine difficulty move to the gluing procedure, especially in the compact case, and which will be discussed later. And for now, let's move to the <coughs> local borderline norm inflation. So now we have the last Lagrangian deformation. Uh, more precisely, if the, uh, the size of Lagrangian deformation at time t0 is greater than some large number m, then we can always find a new initial data whose solution has borderline space norm at the same time t0 greater than m to the power one third. So simply speaking, it means that uh, last Lagrangian deformation induces the local borderline norm inflation. Uh, the proof is as follows. So if the original solution satisfies the desired largeness, that we are done. But otherwise, we add highly oscillating perturbation to the original initial data, which is localized at the point where we have last Lagrangian deformation. And in this way, we can make the perturbed solution has desired largeness. So once we have this, we again apply this proposition to the previously constructed uh, family of initial data then we can get a new family of initial data whose solution have the local borderline norm inflation. So, uh, this proposition. So now we construct the desired local initial data. Uh huh. So I need to get u of t from my initial. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So actually, this initial data can be controlled by the size of that initial data. Ah. Yes, so that smallness still gives the smallness of this initial data. Yeah. For initial data. Right. So now, uh, the final step is gluing procedure. So in this process, we're going to sequentially glue the local initial data to the given initial data. And our aim is to minimize the interaction between local solutions so that the glue solution locally enjoys the uh, local borderline norm inflation. Uh, in the construction of non-compactly supported perturbation, the naive idea of placing local initial data at large distance does the job. Uh, so let's consider the simple case where, where we only have two local initial data f and g so uh, so let's say the support of f is here and support of g is here and then we denote the local solution start from the initial data f by omega tilde then uh, its support will uh, stay close to the support of F in a short time. And also, I denote the glue solution by omega. Then their support will be consist of two parts. One is start from the support of F. <coughs> so maybe I should use color chalk. So this is the support of omega. See? And the other part is looks like this. And we denote each one as omega f, omega g, then actually the glue solution will consist with, uh, consist of omega f from plus omega g. 
So in this setting, this proposition says if the distance between two local initial data is very, very large, the omega tilde f, ah, sorry, omega f will behave almost the same as omega tilde. In other words, <coughs> the glue solution locally behaves like local solution. And the proof is as follows. So we first consider the equation for the omega uh, f, which is uh, given as follows. And then we decompose uh, the velocity into two parts, one involved with omega f and the other involved with omega g. And then in the absence of the second term, this is exactly the original uh, regularized model. So the omega f is actually same with omega tilde. That means this term really reflects the uh, interaction between two solution patches. So the main part is uh, controlling this term uh, as follows. So we can control in its L infinity norm on the support of omega f uh, as follows, where we get 1 over r from the decay of the kernel. <coughs> and once we have this, we can say that if the two local initial data is very uh, at, at a distance very, very large, then the, their interaction can be almost ignorable. And in that way, we can expect the glue, glue solution locally behaves like local solution. And by repeating this proposition, uh, we can construct the, uh, the desired non-compactly supported perturbation. So now let's move to the compact case. So in the compact case, unfortunately, this naive idea doesn't work anymore. <coughs> Instead, and, and actually, like to put the local the sequence of local initial data on some compact set, uh, the local initial data must be placed at an infinitesimal distance eventually. And also. Um, in the construction of local initial data, we require higher frequency to fight with the uh, regularization. And it is, they are likely to intensify the interaction between local solutions. So in worst case, this interaction will destroy uh, the local behavior of the local solution. So to see what really happens, we're going to analyze the propagation of current added <laughs> local initial data in the presence of the previously chosen one. So, which means that... Uh-huh. Uh-huh. For to the older. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. The same as this one, yes. Uh, yes. So, here what we're going to do is there will be a given initial data A, and each iteration we're going to add the local initial data uh, one by one. And uh, so here we want to analyze the propagation of currently added per uh, local initial data in the presence of the previously chosen one. And we hope the local a behavior generated by this local, the currently added local initial data is not destroyed by the previously chosen. Okay, so now see, now let's see the main proposition. So here F represents the previously chosen initial data and we can assume its oldness in X2 variable because the given initial data is old in X2 variable and by adding these patches along the x1 axis, we can at least keep uh, the oddness in x2 variable. And also by the translation pro uh, invariant property of the solution, we can assume the support of f is on the left side of x2 axis with some distance toward zero. <coughs> then we can find uh, currently uh, current local initial data actually in the family of the G of A, which we uh, previously constructed. 
uh, such that the flow map associated with this uh, glue solution have less Lagrangian deformation near the support of the current local initial data. So in other words, the last Lagrangian deformation generated by the current initial data will not be destroyed by uh, in the presence of the previously chosen initial data. So yes, so the proof is as follows. Uh, in the presence of the uh, previously chosen initial data, the glued initial data is no longer old in X1 variable. So the uh, origin is no longer fixed point of the flow map. Instead, it moves along the X1 axis and we denote its location by A of T. And then we hope that before the interaction between two solution, uh, solution patches starting from F and G occurs. So here interaction means before they really meet each other. Uh, we hope the deformation matrix around AT comma zero behaves like the one we would have in the absence of the previously chosen initial data. So in other words, the behavior of the deformation matrix uh, that we have at the origin when uh, F doesn't exist is transferred to uh, the new point. Um, so to see what really happens, uh, AT comma zero, we introduce the new coordinate uh, we, whose origin is this uh, moved origin AT comma zero. And we denote the flow map on, a new uh, on the new coordinate by capital Phi, then its deformation matrix satisfies the following uh, equation. And here, the capital omega corresponds to the solution patch starting from G in a new coordinate. And these two terms will explain the effects of the previously chosen initial data. And as you see, the main effect already have diagonal matrix form. So the remaining part is controlling off diagonal component of the first term, and which can be done <coughs> by using the oddness in X2 variable and by treating this non-local operator differently depends on the location of bubble. And then as before, the derivative velocity has almost diagonal matrix form, and then we can get last Lagrangian deformation even in the presence of the previously chosen initial data. But here, uh, I want to point out one thing. So this proof is actually different from the 2D Euler equation case. And in there, they use, uh, Bougain and Lee use the perturbation argument, which is uh, in some sense reasonable because the main factor is already diagonal matrix form. But uh, that argument doesn't seem to be working for regularized model, uh, especially when gamma is equals to one over two. Uh, the reason is the perturbation argument usually involves with the subcritical norms. And to control subcritical norms, uh, we need the frequency of local initial data grows slow enough. But on the other hand, to fight with the regularization, we need the frequency of local initial data grows fast enough as the uh, index goes to infinity. And this ba balance will be uh, out of control when gamma is uh, equal to one over two, which is the regularization is as strong as possible. But uh, with this direct approach, you can, uh, we can avoid the subcritical <coughs> norms and uh, we can overcome those. All right, so now let me uh, summarize my talk. So in the borderline sobel of space, the regularized model is strongly opposed when gamma is less than or equal to one over two. And it is well opposed when gamma is greater than one over two. So in other words, the local well postness problem of this regularized model is completely solved in the borderline sobel of space. And it also tells us that even for regularized to the old equation, uh, we have the strong imposedness in the same borderline sobel of space. And, and for the remaining time, let me introduce one open problem <coughs> in this direction, so which is the well postness or ill postness of the surface quasi geostrophic equation in the borderline sobel of space. 
So as QG equation is uh, important among the fluid model because it often mentioned as a toy model of 3D all equation. Well, their behavior is very similar, but the spatial domain is restricted to R2 or SQG. But so the equation as it is looks very similar with 2D all equation. Uh, but their velocity has one additional derivative. And because of that, the sobel of space become h2 uh, instead of h1. But because of this singular velocity, even though we start from the smooth initial data, we can't guarantee the global lifespan of the solution. And that caused some trouble uh, in establishing strong iltosmic. So in the local construction, we don't have any problem. But the problem is um, we can't guarantee the uniform lifespan of local solution. So in worst case, these local solution, the lifespan of local solution will be shrinked as index goes to infinity. Then when we glue them together, we can't expect the glue solution exists for a short time. And that's the, so I guess that's the reason <coughs> that this problem is still open. But of course, the global lifespan is not necessary condition. So I guess one can still solve this strong yield post in SQG. So this is end of my talk. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.